Good morning, everybody. Welcome to December 20th, our Christmas service, or I should say one of our pre-Christmas services. And so, good to be in the house of the Lord today. Going to have a beautiful day today. I think we're going to hit about maybe 72 or 73, which is amazing weather this time of year in December. Um, just want to start off with a couple of announcements. One thing I want to talk about, it's a little further out there, but the Daniel Fast this year, in case you were wondering, it will begin on January the 10th, which is really cool because it actually gives you a little bit of time after the first of the year to kind of be begin to prepare for the fast. Make sure you have everything you need, kind of set your mind and your heart together once you get past Christmas and New Year's, you can really begin to focus on how you want to fast, what you want to do during that 21-day period. So it'll be January, uh, Sunday, January the 10th through Sunday, January 31st. And so that'll be the 21 days of the Daniel fast this year. Usually starts a little earlier, but just worked out where we had that extra Sunday there. And so I think it'll be a good thing. I know I've already begun to make some adjustments in my diet. Um, over this last week, and I'm going to continue to do that. I like to kind of really, I'm kind of really, really focusing in on what I want to do this year and really praying about that. And uh, so this will give you time to do that too. So, hey, don't want to interrupt your partying and eating things you probably shouldn't eat. You still got some time to do that. But um, so you will have time to detox a little bit coming into the Daniel fast this year. Also, this Tuesday night, 630 is chapter one in our book, uh, The Armor of Light, Michael Christian's book. He was on with us two weeks ago, uh, and uh, we had a great time together with him. And so we will uh, be having our first chapter study, and we sent those notes out yesterday. Joanne sent the notes out yesterday. If you didn't receive the notes, uh, let us know. Um, if, you, if you want a book, The Armor of Light, and did not receive one from us, also let us know, and uh, we'll make sure through Amazon we'll just send you one fastest way to get it to you that way. We want you to be a part of the study. We sent out 22 books. I'm sure there are some people that may have wanted them that we didn't get everybody, but we tried. But we are more than welcome to send you a book. We want to give you a book and have you be a part of this long-term Bible study that we'll be in over the next several months, every other Tuesday night for a little while. And then once Pastor Rick finishes his Acres of Diamonds series, uh, he'll be teaching every other week uh, in this as well. So it'll be an every week series moving forward once we finish Acres of Diamonds. And if you've been with us in Acres of Diamonds, you realize that's probably not gonna happen real quickly. That's gonna take a little while. So, uh, but we're having a great time on Tuesday night. Hope that you'll, uh, if you haven't been able to join us before, know that you're always welcome. So how do you get involved? Real simple, um, if, you, if you didn't get the notes or you, didn't, or you need a book, uh, just let Rick know in the chat or send the church an email at kaipachurchofgod at gmail.com. You type at church, got a gmail, got dot com, just send us an email, and we will make sure uh, that you get everything. So we want you to be a part and be involved. We also want you to use these books for you. If you're not going to be involved in the in the online Bible study, that's fine. We'd love you to, for you to be able to use these books during the time of the Daniel Fast. So we definitely want you to have a book, and uh, we're glad to help you out with that. Also, um, this is a book that's really going to, like an early discipleship book. So we're really hoping that this book will be one of three books that will in the future be part of the discipleship program of our church. And so we're really excited about that, kind of like a new believers or first steps type situation. Also want to say that uh, Carlos and Valentina, our children, our two children in Ecuador, um, we sent extra money for their families to have a very special Christmas. So I appreciate your donations. And so it's once again, <clears throat> I know I talked about this last week, had an amazing, um, yeah, uh, Pastor Rick, I think I'm going to need a water from back there. For some reason, I was doing fine until I started talking. I haven't talked much this morning, so now that I'm talking, I'm not doing fine. So, um, yeah, has to get the mask down, hazmat suit on, hand the water. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, thank you. So we are excited about them celebrating Christmas. In fact, yesterday, I believe, the 19th was supposed to be the first Christmas celebration in Ecuador, part of the Ecuador Christmas. And so some of you have been watching. We've been posting some of them online uh, on our Facebook page. 
but many of you are, are Facebook friends with Tamitha, and she's been giving us updates. There's been lots of updates on Facebook of what's going on with the kids, and it's really been exciting uh, to see the best Christmas ever. And so, and it was, and, and for those of you that maybe didn't hear me talk about it last week, I'll take just a minute this week to say it was the best Christmas ever. So once again, we raised an incredible amount of money, uh, about 50, a little over $5,400 for Christmas Ecuador, then over another $5,000 for Ecuador food relief. So over $10,000 uh, for Christmas Ecuador and for Ecuador food relief. And we're not done yet. And so here's the thing, two things. Um, we're raising money now for Christmas 2021. And we'll start that in earnest in January. We have people that are very committed and dedicated and they begin to donate money in January for the coming Christmas. So what a great church we have and great supporters and then also we'll have Linda will be selling aprons again soon. We give her like one or two weeks off, I think. I forget. But uh, she can have more time than off, but she doesn't want to. But um, we, we're always raising money for Ecuador. That's really the bottom line. We stay in Ecuador gear pretty much all the time. We get really earnest about it in the spring where we usually have our first pour out and really start charging towards Christmas. But God helped us have an amazing year. We're going to keep raising money for food. So some of you are still saying money. We're probably averaging getting right about $50 a weekend, sometimes a little bit more for Ecuador food. So we're going to keep sending $50 to $100 every week. As long as we have money coming in, we're going to send it, try to help them get through this last part of the virus there in Ecuador, uh, probably for the months of probably January through you know, April, May. Uh, this is just whatever the Lord provides for us, we're going to send to them and uh, just keep helping them. And I think most of you know that their situation is, is really dire in a lot of ways. And, and you can think about how things are here in the States. You can just imagine what it's like in another country that doesn't have near the type of medical systems and stuff that we have. And so, uh, but I want to encourage you that uh, if you're able to give and you want to give, uh, we'll make sure that it gets there to help feed those kids there in Ecuador and continue to be a part of it. We'll keep updating that every week. We'll give you the new total, and that total keeps growing, and it'll continue to grow until we stop giving for that and back into Christmas mode again. So really very thankful and very proud of our church. So 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 appreciative of our Ecuador uh, missions coordinator, Sandy Lidbaum, and uh, our chief fundraiser, uh, Linda Evans. And uh, I really appreciate it. I'm going to name people, and I'm going to get myself in trouble because I'm going to forget somebody. But uh, I think, you know, Sarah was a lot of help in helping uh, so some of the aprons for the kids' aprons. Shelly helped us with masks. Um, we have all these people that are involved in helping us in all different areas. I think uh, Joanne made labels. I mean, everybody did something. Uh, Bill and Amy, Amy sent us um, material to help make the aprons. And so, and, uh, so many of you uh, gave and created. And, and every dime, in fact, even in the early days, we were still crushing cans and, and doing bottles and and uh, some of you were so generous in your donation. And also, I, I really appreciate all the people that bought the merchandise, all the people that we don't even know their names, but that bought the aprons and bought the merchandise and the masks that helped us raise this money for Ecuador. This was really a, a team effort, and it took not just our church, but our community and, and strangers that believed in it. I think about, about the Sullivans who help us with um, our movie nights when we have those and they donated one of the movie nights to help our children in Ecuador and so just been a, a real outpouring of generosity but the mainstay the mainstay for our church always is it's those systematic givers they give every month to the church faithfully they tithe tithe and they keep blessing the church and that helps us do everything that we've done and if it wasn't for you we we couldn't do this but you have been faithful and you've been more than faithful and I'm extremely appreciative of that appreciative. I really, really, really am and, and grateful for all that God's done and blessed us during this time. So last announcement. I know I'm doing a lot of announcements. So this Thursday night, it was my hope. It was my hope. In the back of my mind, I was hoping a month or so ago that I might be able to open up the church doors for Christmas Eve because it's so late at night and, uh, and do that. Uh, but unfortunately, as this situation has went on, even though I knew things were going to be kind of difficult with the virus, uh, it's such a critical point right now for our health care workers that out of respect for our health care workers, and that, that's my only concern right now, out of respect for our health care workers, 
Um, we're going to do this outside because we're outside anyway, singing around the Christmas tree at the very end. So we're just going to shorten the service by about 30 minutes. It'll start at 1130. Uh, we'll have chairs out there. Uh, Pastor David and Amberly Prada, they're loaning us um, two heaters. So Pastor Rick is going to grab those heaters for us. So we'll have two heaters. And so uh, we'll try to make you as warm as possible. We'll provide chairs so you'll be comfortable for that 30 minutes. And we'll just have a very important time together because one of the great things that we do is that we welcome in Christmas Day. And that means a lot to me personally. And I think it's become something that's meant a lot to a lot of people in our church. So here's the other good news of this. We're going to Facebook Live this. So if for any reason, whether you're, maybe you're under the weather, maybe it's just way too late for you, maybe you live out of the area, um, uh, you'll be able to watch this on Facebook Live. And so we want to do that for you this year. So everybody, if, if you live in another state and you used to participate with us doing this, you can be a part of what we're doing this Christmas Eve, 1130. Uh, we'll be live online till about 1205, welcoming Christmas Day. So you're welcome to join us in person or on Facebook Live Christmas Eve, 1130. So hope, that, hope either way that you will be with us. And some of you that live in other time zones, you'll be able to watch it at a different time. Uh, or you can stay up till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and watch if you like. That's especially for the people in North Carolina and Texas and uh, Alabama and, let's see, I mean, uh, Florida. We have several people that are on our online ministry that live in different states. And so, but we want you to be a part. And, um, and uh, we love Jesus. We love Christmas. And we love celebrating. So, um, I want to open up just uh, real quickly with prayer before I begin to preach. Um, and just, Lord, we just pray that you would bless our time together today. Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus for every one of our people. And Lord, I, I pray that it just, it's been on my heart since day one. And I realize that sometimes that people don't like to hear bad news. I know that. I know that we're designed that way. We, we don't like bad news. We want good news. And sometimes we just can't accept it when the news isn't what we want it to be. But Lord, from the very first day, I felt an extreme burden, just a burden for our health care workers. And we have had the sign up to pray for our health care workers in front of our church for the, probably the past seven or eight months, Lord. And, and I believe that I left that sign up even through Christmas because I believe that, that we want to honor you in praying for them and honor them in believing God for, for, their, for their families and for the work that they do. That I want to honor all of our of our first responders, every person that, that works a job, that whether it's a person giving us groceries or a gas station or whatever their job is, that every day they do their job to try to help our society move forward. And all the businesses that have even many litigations with them, many, um, comp, many difficult situations that they have to try to work through, yet they do their very best to give their very best. And Lord, I'm, I'm grateful for them. But from, the, but from the very first, my heart has went out to ambulance drivers and health care workers and the people that are on the front lines of taking care of us. And I pray once again, God, that you just bless them and that you would touch them and heal their families and encourage their hearts and help them not to be discouraged. And I pray that maybe in some small way that it would encourage them to know that, that our church loves them, that we're praying for them, that we believe in them, that we're doing our best. We're trying to do our part to help them, to help them do their job and their ministry that they have. And I pray, God, that you just continue to allow us to, to be a part of a healing process, a solution, I pray, and that you would just reach down in a very special way, reach down to those hospitals today, reach down to all those places, and may a spirit of encouragement sweep over all those who are weary, who are tired. Jesus, you said for those of us that were in that condition to come to you and you would give us rest. I pray may there be supernatural rest given to all those who have given so much, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. I guess you figured out I get really emotional when I talk about that. I don't really know why, I just do. It's uh, one of those things that's always on my heart. The Christmas star. The Christmas star. Man, it's exciting. Uh, we, have, we have some exciting events. You know, 2020 has had some unfortunate events, but there's some exciting things happening. So as I'm going to read here in the... Gospel of Matthew chapter 2, we're going to read uh, the Christmas star in the biblical version, then we're going to talk about our Christmas star. 
So Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And we had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together. He inquired of them, where the Christ was to be born. So they asked him, In Bethlehem in Judea, thus, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me so that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east before them till it came over and stood where the young child was. So they saw the star again. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So as the story in the Gospel of Matthew goes, a bright star rose um, announcing the birth of Jesus Christ. And that wise men followed this star. So was it a comet? Was it a supernova? Could it have been the conjunction of two planets like we're getting ready to experience today? Uh, this week there will be a great conjunction. Not just a conjunction, because every 20 years there's a conjunction, but a great conjunction. And that term is used by astronomers when it comes to describe a situation in the solar system where Jupiter and Saturn appear to pass each other very closely. Um, a conjunction is apparently the passing of two or more celestial bodies, while there, a great conjunction refers only to Jupiter and Saturn. So we have a great event that we'll have an opportunity to see this evening. So Jupiter and Saturn basically uh, tangle in the great conjunction as seen from the Earth every 19.85 years, basically 20 years. It's a natural symptom of Jupiter taking 11.86 years to orbit the Sun and Saturn another 29.4 years, which naturally means they will sometimes appear to pass each other in the night sky. So from our point of view, that they are close, but in reality, they are really are millions of miles distant from each other. But this once in, in a lifetime, once in 10 lifetime events, uh, will be the closest conjunction that, that could be easily observed. So that's where I want to go with this, that they actually be able to see it since... 1226, so it's been a long time since they've had one of these. The good news is you can see it tonight, and uh, right after sundown, or again on, uh, again on Tuesday evening, so tonight right after sundown, and again on Tuesday. Why not Monday? I have no idea. So tonight, right after sundown, Tuesday, right after sundown. And so uh, there have been calculations that have been made by about previous great conduction junctions of Jupiter and Saturn around the same time that suggested the birth of baby Jesus. And so that's why this is a really big event. In fact, uh, the lid bombs and Hemsley should be really excited today because based on our calculations, you've got to look to the southwest. So when I step out from my house to the church parking lot, I will need to look over the homes of uh, Bill and Carrie and St. L.R. And there, right after sunset, I should see the Christmas star. So it... It could be a, a source of pride for them, maybe, that the Christmas star is rising up above their house. And uh, so uh, um, I thought that was funny anyway. So the cool thing is, so tonight, right after sunset, so don't wait. Don't go out super late at night. You won't see it. you got to go right at sundown. Be ready because it'll be that first hour or so that will be most visible. So like I said, look that direction, southwest, somewhere around maybe 530 Possibly it's a good time to start looking for it, and hopefully you'll get to see this once in 800-year event tonight. Now, it's not a stretch, in my opinion, 
that most scholars believe there's about a six-year window which Jesus could have been born. The interpretation of that is we don't know the exact date. Um, whether it was the Great Conjunction or Halley's Comet, yeah, you heard that right. Basically, Halley's Comet passed the Earth around 12 B.C. And so between five and ten years before most scholars argue that Jesus would have been born, but it was close in that timeline. So this we do know, there was a star that announced the birth of the newborn king, and the wise men saw it, and they followed it. And so, but there is very much a good opportunity that what we will see tonight is exactly what the wise men saw all those years ago. So we look back again at Matthew chapter 2, looking at verses 1 and 2. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Matthew's focus is less on the details of Christ's birth and, uh, and more about an event that took place after Jesus was born. So while Luke tells more of the story when it comes to the angels and the shepherds and the birth of Christ, Matthew focuses on the wise men in that event. And so, you know, our Christmas carols say that we three kings of Orion are, and so basically uh, the idea of there being three kings, but in reality that's probably a misconception. They were wise men, they were magi, they were astronomers. And so the tradition of the magi were kings, it can be traced back and basically the influence of the Old Testament passages that say that kings will come and worship the Messiah. And so uh, Psalm 68, 29 says, Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring presents to you. So, could they have been astronomer kings? Unlikely, but possible. It's a thought that they were more than three, probably an entire company of travelers. And so there's the three, but there was a whole company that probably traveled with them. So church traditions even tell us their names, supposedly. So maybe that should be the trivia question. So who can name the three wise men? Okay, so you guys ready? So the first one is Melchior. Melchior is the first wise man. The second one is Caspar, kind of like Casper, Caspar. Second one is Balthasar. It's a little harder, but sounds kind of like a Pokemon name, actually. Balthasar. So here we go. Mel Melchior. Caspar and Balthasar. So those are the three. They're supposedly the three there. What's what their names were. So maybe after church, Rick, we should figure out, go out and name them, figure out which one is which. And so you can see, uh, supposedly we see their skulls in the great cathedral at Cologne, Germany. And so, so if you hold to the belief that they were kings, you won't get any argument with me because what's important is they existed and they followed the star. Now, being from the East, uh, most, there's some contention they would have been among the Jews who were exiled by Judah and, uh, and basically in Israel centuries before. Now, some people believe that they were Gentiles, and it could have been either way at this rate. But I'd like to propose to you that I'm going to go with the thought that these are exiled Jews. And, um, and like I said, they could have been Gentiles, and a lot of people believe that they were Gentiles, but they could have very well been exiled Jews. And so... They would have been aware of the promise of the Messiah uh, like other believing Jews. And so waiting for the consolation of Israel. So they would have been waiting for an event, waiting for the Messiah. And that's one of the reasons why I strongly believe that they were exiled Jews. Guided by the astronomical phenomenon, the star, they came to Jerusalem, the Jewish capital, expecting the leaders to know the exact location of the newly born king of the Jews. So one of the things is, you know, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? An exact question they ask. For we have seen his star in the east. The significance that God met the wise men in their own medium, he guided the astronomers by a star. I love that. When you think about that, that's totally natural for this to happen. Because Jesus always ministered to people exactly where they were. Fishermen and farmers and storekeepers and whatever, whatever they did for a living, Jesus was able to speak to them about things that they knew, things that could understand. Jesus didn't go around telling stories that were so far over their head that they'd never have any idea of what he meant. But he would often take the common things of life and explain very high spiritual principles through very plain common things of life. 
And so here he is, he takes the astronomers, these very wise, educated men. They're looking at the stars, and he comes to them in a medium that they could understand. He gives them a great sign, the sign of the star. This is also a fulfillment of Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. So it's widely regarded as by ancient Jewish scholars as this is a considered a Masonic, uh, basically Masonic prediction. And so you notice that the wise men said it is his star. And uh, we have seen his star and we have come to worship him. Very personalized. Not we have seen a star, we have, but we've seen his star. We've come to worship him. This star was only related to the birth of Christ as far as they were concerned. The wise men came to Jerusalem expecting a city excited for the newly born king. But what they found was something very different than that. What they found was indifference of the religious leaders of the time. And uh, think about that. It kind of reminds me of our current Congress and senators. Indifference. They're really good at indifference. Yes, pastor said something political. Yes, I didn't name either party. I just decided to lump the whole government together with that. So we have much indifference. And so they had indifference in the society back then. So they've traveled a long ways to come see the newborn king. And they're met with, yeah, we're not so much interested. Taking a line from the Grinch, the mayor wasn't happy. Those of you who watched the movie, you know exactly what that line's about. That the mayor wasn't happy. Herod the king heard this and he was troubled. He was troubled. The mayor was not happy. The king wasn't happy. So what we have is a disinterested clergy and a threatened king. Wow. Does that sound interesting? I'm just going to leave that one there. Matthew chapter 2, verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So why are the people troubled? Well, they're troubled. One of the reasons why is because of Herod's paranoia. Um, he, was, he was well known about his outburst. And basically, he had no problem killing anyone that didn't agree with him. And so they could have also been troubled by this event. If you think about the fact of the three wise men, if they came with a large caravan, if they ended up had come with a large caravan, it's possible that that caravan would have very much displayed the greatness and dignity of who they were looking for. So they're thinking, these wise men in this great caravan has come to worship the Jewish king, a newborn king. So obviously it's a disturbing time for unbelievers at this point. The reign of Herod gives us a... Uh, chronological marking point so here's one of those moments where we can look and see that um, Jesus Jesus was born before the death of Herod the Great so which is probably to be dated uh, 4 BC so that's making this event that we are about to experience tonight even more likely to be the same event that happened on the night of Jesus's birth so I thought you might like to know that. So once again, chronologically, we're in the right area for this. Matthew chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. And when they had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, uh, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are not least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. So they knew the prophecy. Then Herod came, and he had secretly called for the wise men, determined from them what time the star was about, or basically it appeared. And he sent them to, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. It's very interesting when you think about this. So basically Herod, it's obviously that Herod is trying to use uh, the wise men to find uh, Jesus. Herod's only intent was evil. The scriptures bear that out later on where he basically uh, ordered all the, board, all the baby boys that were two years and, and younger to be killed. And so uh, one of the most terrible events in their history during that time. And so his intent was, was terrible. 
but the deal of it is, is so he says to the wise men, so that I may go and worship him. Now, here's the deal. The wise men probably didn't show up for a year, maybe two years after Jesus was born. They had a long trip. And so we find this thing that, you know, all the, all the priests that are around there in Jerusalem, you know, Bethlehem's only six miles away from them. So six miles away, the newborn king has been born, and he's been around as a toddler for a year or two, and nobody's went to look for him. Nobody, nobody recognized the sign, even though everybody knew that there's, there, there's a Messiah that was to be born. Nope, nobody's interested, nobody's looking. But all of a sudden, Herod, he wants to go worship. He wants to go worship. Now, nobody has taken any interest in worshiping. In fact, what's interesting about this is you notice that there's nothing ever said that the religious leaders of the time ever went to worship the newborn king. In fact, they didn't. Only the wise men did. And so when you begin to realize how what the spiritual apathy was of that time, that Jesus came into the world at a very dark spiritual time. We worry about spiritual darkness now, and rightfully so. But I want to remind you that Jesus came into the world at just the right moment, just the right time. The world needed a Savior desperately. The religious leaders and structures needed a Savior desperately. Um, Herod needed to be removed desperately. So as we move on to verse 9, the Bible goes on and says, And when they heard... The king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. So here's the deal. There was a time period between when they first saw the star and they were traveling. And they didn't see the star. They just went to where the star had, had pointed them to go. Then once they got to Jerusalem, received their instruction, the star does what? It appears again and rest right over where Jesus is at. That's the supernatural part of the story. That part, I'm, I'm not trying to, to line that up with any kind of planetary system. I'm saying that specific star, I believe that was a supernatural event because the star reappeared right where they needed it so they could find the baby Jesus and also so they could rejoice that they had followed the right star and found the Messiah. So when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and mirth. But then be divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod. They departed for their own country another way. They presented gifts and they gave their worship. That's an important part. Um, the scripture says that the star continued to guide them. It's continual guidance. I want you to think about that. Uh, some people don't believe in putting wise men in the manger scene, because they weren't there the night that Jesus was born. In fact, I think Pastor Rick and I, we talked about this when we were doing the setup with Rob, you know, that the wise men came later. In fact, there's some people that are very adamant about this, that they put the wise men a little ways away from the manger scene, like they're traveling toward it, which is I'm totally fine with. In fact, it, it, it's a cool idea. So um, they place them away from Bethlehem, like they're still traveling to get there. And I understand that's completely biblically correct. Um, so why do we here at the church place the wise men in our manger scene? And probably most of you do as well. Uh, well, consider this. Why not? Is it not like we place them in between, you know, Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus? If you come look at our manger scene, that'd be kind of awkward. Mary's off to the side over here. Joseph's way over here. Jesus is there and the wise men are like camped right there in the middle. You know, that's not what the manger scene looks like. You know, it's, it's, it's Mary's there with Jesus. Joseph is there. The, the holy family's right there together. And then everyone out is on the outside edges of, of this wonderful event. And so like us, the wise men are like us. On, we're peering into the event. So when we come up to the Christmas tree and we're singing Christmas carols and we're looking at that, we're like the wise men. We're peering into this event. We're, we're beholding the Christ child. We're beholding Mary and Joseph and the Christ child. And so like, this, like the uh, wise men, we're, we're spectators and participators at the same time. And we're appearing in with wonder and worship of our own. So we have much in common with the wise men. Um, have you considered that this thought that, it, you know, was it took them so long to see Jesus, isn't that a lot like us? I got to really thinking about this. You know, think about 
how much we're like the wise men. Some of us took years to find Jesus. Some of us took years to search and to find Jesus. Sometimes we didn't even know what we were looking for until we found it. And so the wise men remind me of us. Because when I think about them, if they took them maybe a year or two years, that was what a commitment it was on their part to come and worship the newborn king. How, how astonished they must have been to have made such great personal sacrifice to come and worship the newborn king and to see nothing but apathy around the city of where he was born. That, that must have been very disturbing to them because they were so committed to come and to worship and to recognize what had been given to the, to the world. So what I want to say about the nativity is, is it, it doesn't exclude, it brings us together. The Christmas nativity brings us together. It doesn't exclude anybody, it brings everybody together. And so when you look at our nativity, you'll see uh, three wise men, you'll see a little, little shepherd boy there with a sheep, you know. Uh, we have an angel, you know, because we know the angels were there at the time of Mary and Joseph. Me. So every, everyone's involved in this process. Everyone can come and celebrate the birth of Jesus. And so, for unto us the Savior is born in the city of David, who is Christ the Lord. And so of all the holy days of the year, I never feel closer to God than on Christmas. And it's always been that way for me. And that's why we're a little Christmas crazy around here because, you know, I realize that it's a tremendous sacrifice to stand outside at midnight when it's cold. And even on a nice day, it's going to be cold at midnight. But there is something that it does in my heart to sing Silent Night at midnight in front of that tree. It, It just absolutely blesses my whole next day. I mean, I go home and shortly I go to bed after that and I wake up with a peace in my heart, knowing that I, the first thing I did on Christmas was to worship Jesus. And ever since I started doing that, it really changed Christmas for me. Christmas has never been a disappointment for me as long as I put him first. And I think sometimes that Christmas is a disappointment for some people, that there's a lot of buildup to Christmas, but then the day's over and it's almost like post-Christmas depression sets in. But I want to tell you, I want to give you the cure this morning for post-Christmas depression or even Christmas depression. I want to tell you that unto us is born this day in the city of David, Christ the Lord, the Savior. When you focus on Jesus and what he can mean in your life, and if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you definitely want to make him the Lord of your life before or during this Christmas season. Christmas will never be the same for you once you have made Jesus your personal Savior, it'll always mean the world to you. And so you can join the rest of us Christmas crazies because you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Europe canceled the holidays. I always thought that was a, a terrible line, you know. Christmas is canceled. Christmas is not canceled, you know. And they had to come out and say, hey, nobody's canceling Christmas. We're just saying you can't travel. You know, and granted, I mean, I'm not, I'm not even speaking to whether that's right or wrong. I'm just simply saying that, Christmas doesn't get canceled. Christmas is going to come. Christmas will come if nobody comes out to that tree on Christmas Eve. Christmas is still going to come. It's not dependent on you and me. He took care of Christmas. All we get to do, we get to come and honor the sacrifice that he made. So no matter what a government does or doesn't do, they cannot cancel Christmas. You can, maybe you can modify celebrations. You can, you can celebrate Christmas differently than what you normally do. But here's the deal. I find it very interesting that no matter how much regulation is out there, I am still can celebrate Christmas the way I want to, and that is to go out to that tree and be out there at midnight and sing Silent Night and welcome in Christmas Day. And no government has anything to do with that. In fact, actually, the government has given us permission to do that. We can do whatever we want to outside. So... Regardless, either way, Christmas is going to come, and we're the participants of it. And so making this holiday something more than just the parties and the gifts and and the stress and the traffic and all the other things involved is putting the center of it on Jesus. And that's why it's not Happy Holidays. That's why it's Merry Christmas, because it's about Jesus, and it's about him coming to this earth 
and being the greatest gift that anyone could ever receive in their life. In closing, Leonardo uh, da Vinci, uh, the great painter, uh, began painting a commissioned work called The Adoration of the Magi. And uh, he, was going, he was painting this for a monastery outside of Florence. And uh, so he was commissioned in 1480 to paint the painting. He worked on it. It was an 8 by 9 foot painting. He worked on it quite a bit. But then he moved to Milan before it was done. And so he never finished the painting. So it's, it's an unfinished painting of that. And a lot of people have... Uh, you know, used it in negative connotation. He was very young when he started this painting. I think he was about 20, 29 years old, I think it was. And so, you know, he basically didn't come back and finish what he started. I've heard people have used that, but I have a whole different take to this. So first of all, I want to tell you something about this painting. Even today, in its unfinished form, it is considered and recognized as one of the most important works that he ever painted is recognized as one of the most important works he ever painted, even though he didn't finish it. Second of all, I want you to think about this Adoration of the Magi differently. Because the work is not finished, that means what? There's still room to add to it. Now, there were others that ended up painting this picture, but they didn't finish his. So when we come, every person that comes to the Christ, like we always say, though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross for you, that because of that being unfinished, it left open for all the people that could be part of that painting. So it never being finished is a wonderful thing because the work of Christ is not finished in our lives. He finished the initial work of our salvation, but the ongoing work of seeing people come to know Jesus and to make Jesus the center of their life is a never-ending story. And so we can be part of a good thing when it comes to that painting the adoration of the magi that the work of winning people to christ is unfinished and pastor rick has put a painting up it's very similar to that yes i believe that's correct so we can be part of that i just touched me i realized maybe i didn't explain that well but i just was really taken when i began to read the story about him painting this painting and about him not finishing. I read a lot of negative comments about him not finishing this, this painting. In fact, I think there's people that actually preach messages on, you know, don't be a quitter on your life's work. I mean, it's very interesting, the perspectives that come. But I saw it totally differently. I saw that the fact that it wasn't finished means that there's still an opportunity for us to be a part of that masterpiece. You are the masterpiece. You are the work, the handiwork of our creator God and he loves you and he wants you to be a part of his story. That's always his desire. There'll always be room for you to come and be a part of the story that saved all of us, saved all humanity, that Jesus died for our sins, that he was born as a child to live among us, that he died and paid the price for our sins, that he rose again and now stands on the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. What a, what a beautiful way to think about Christmas. You'll never, ever think about Christmas differently once you make Jesus put him in the right place as the right present. Once to prepare to take communion, we'll also take communion. Uh, those of you that are able to be with us will take communion. And if you are online uh, Christmas Eve, that you prepare to take communion with us. So we will be taking communion also on Christmas Eve. Lord, I, I raise the bread, which represents the body of Jesus that was broken for us, whose stripes were bore on his back for our healing. I know that every day, every day, more than once a day, I am made aware of someone that desperately needs a healing from Jesus. And I realize that that's liable to be that way for some time. But I want to say today with all my heart that I believe that there is healing found in Jesus Christ. And I believe that by your stripes we are healed. And I claim healing over all those that desperately need a healing from the Lord. I claim it because you paid the price for it. It is ours to receive it, and we receive it by faith. By faith today, I pray that you will pray with me by faith to receive your healing. 
that whatever is happening in your body, whatever is going on in your life, whether, whether it be physical or mental, emotional, whatever is happening, emotional, that God is your healer, that you will receive your healing by faith in the name of Jesus as we take the body of Christ. The cup and the juice that's in the cup represents the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. Today, you may find yourself in need of forgiveness. It's been a little while since you've really said, Lord, I need your help. I need to really recommit my life to you. Really begin to live and follow Christ. It may be that you've never made that commitment. You've never said, Father, forgive me of my sins. Lord, forgive me. I want you to be the king of my life. I want you to be the Lord of my life. But today, if you'll say those words, you say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Make me clean. I want to belong to you. You can be part of the kingdom of God. You can be just like the thief on the cross who said, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responded by saying, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. It only takes a couple of words. It doesn't have to be a long prayer. Just a short prayer, but it has to be a concerned heart saying, Lord, I realize I've sinned and come short of your glory, and I'm asking for your forgiveness, and I want to live my life for you. It's a very simple step, and it's the most meaningful thing that you'll ever do in your life when you make that commitment. Even today, though I've been a Christian for many years, every time someone prays a prayer of salvation, I pray the prayer with them. Once again, I'm reliving my experience of knowing Jesus as my personal Savior. I never get tired of asking the Lord to forgive me and thanking God for his forgiveness and his salvation. I want the greatest gift for you, not only to be Jesus Christ in your life, but to know that your eternity is secure in him and your relationship in Jesus, that heaven is your home. And in a time of trouble and difficulty, I want you to know there's a safe place to be found in Jesus. Lord, we take the cup to recognize your sacrifice for us. pray that God will bless you and keep you. And um, for those of you that are able to physically come to the Christmas Eve service, I'll love to see you. For those that will watch online, we'll love for you to join us. And uh, we just want you to be a part. I pray that God will just bless this week. It'd be just a wonderful week of celebration in your hearts and lives. And I pray for God's protection over you and your family during this holiday season. Just pray for his healing and his protection. And I know that, that we can ask God to do that and we can expect that God will do that. And uh, if, I don't, if you don't hear from me between now and then, I wish you a very Merry Christmas and a blessed Christmas in Jesus Christ. And uh, last thing I want to say, you want to be a part of our Bible study. If you need a book, whatever you need, just hit that email. Or call me personally. If you got my number, call me. And uh, we'll get you included because we want you to be a part of all that we're doing. God bless you and have a great day in Jesus. Mm-hmm.